na katuri watu wa kuringa kahari ya hoi kiti mwano wai ora wai ora te yukai po wai nen homeland the character rongo has a um hardly says anything in the play she's one of these um she basically sits and watches and observes and listens and takes on um, everything really. She takes on uh, the parent's struggle and her sister's and her brother's struggle. Nanny, I'm so hungry. Well, not for Kai, but for words. And the struggle for, for Rungo is seeing the family deteriorate because they're pretending to be something that they're not. Dad said, if we lived like the Pākehā, then they'll leave us in peace and we'll be strong. Hika, <laughs> get the pēhia tato. I don't think we'll ever learn their ways. We'll be a lost people first. Taku nui e, taku tike tike, i ahumai aku tipuna. E harata kuto, i te toa takitahi, engari, e toa taki mano. Tawhiti. Tawhiti. I need you. I will build us a great white house to live in. No. We are the land. Arthur, if you trample the mana of the land, you trample on me also. It took me probably about six months, maybe just to get the character, you know, down, um, understand the ropes, get used to the sound, the noise on set. Just before a, for a take, that was quite full on. I remember thinking, why is it so noisy? I can't concentrate. I'm going to forget my lines, and you know, I was just, you know, because I was think I was about twenty, I think, when I got that role, and I had just graduated from drama school. Um, and there were people like Elizabeth McRae and Lisa Crittenden, who I used to watch on Prisoner religiously. I loved Prisoner when I was a kid. Um, and Tim, of course. Um, and so I was feeling quite intimidated. But it took me about six months to get my, you know, get my, get my footing. And um, after that, you know, five minutes, look at script, bang, on set, shoot it, off set. She was interesting because she was the only regular Māori character, female, on prime time at the time. So there wasn't a lot of um, room, I felt, personally, to move. Um, they kept trying to take her to all sorts of different places, but I kept resisting. And I, um, and I did that for, for, for a reason, because at that stage in the 90s, you know, people weren't talking about Jackie Money, the character. They, was, they were always referring to her as the Māori nurse um, on Shortland Street. So anything <clears throat> that got um, penned for Jackie Money's character reflected on all Māori women rather than it just being about this one character making a mistake or this one character, you know, being horrendously rude or horrible or racist or what, you know, whatever they wanted to think, you know, storylines they wanted to think up for her. So I made a conscious decision just to make sure that I didn't take her down a road where there was, you know, no way of her being able to get back up on her feet again, even though it was a soap. Um, but, you know, I mean, I kind of... And I, and I was quite staunched about that. And people were actually very kind about making sure that 
I did get you know, storylines that was quite comfortable for me at the time. Because the last thing I want to do is... What's this all about? Well, if Tay's going to spend so much time here... Me marina pe a korua. Oh, nga hui a Taylor. I kia kaui whaki ki tētahi tangata. Ke atu. What's going on? Oh, i ki te nga hui i taku ringi. She was supposed to keep it a secret. Sorry, bro. He wa papa o taku tua he ne. Hoi hoi. Anyway, we think it's great. Koea. Yeah, and it was nice of you two to put things on hold after Dad passed away. If you want to make your engagement official, you have our support. Tēnā kōtou katoa. Ko te āre taku ingoa, he hōia, i mate au i te pakanga i Vietnam. I mate tōku wairua, i mate katoa o ku hoa. Nā reira ku au, he ke hua noiho. Tēnā tātau katoa. I had to tell my, bring my father up and go, oh, Dad, um, I've got this new role, and I'm playing a lesbian, just letting you know, just so you're not going to be shocked by it um, when it comes out. And he was, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but he saw it on television once. He turned it over, and I happened to be at home at the time, and it, it was on, and my character was doing something stupid, and he was like, Oh, what's that rubbish? And then it turned it over. <laughs> like, oh, far out. Um, thank God he didn't actually watch. He would have been... A... Yeah, because we were so bad. But um, the relationship dynamic, it was really easy. Um, I liked the character because, you know, like I said, she was free. Um, there was no real major responsibility. Me and Sophia, were, you know, just got up there and did it and had a good time and... Um, I think the the scene in the kitchen was the only time we were like, <laughs> there's all these people staring at us. It was like, I wasn't allowed to move until she got <laughs> her robe put back on her. But it was all, I mean, it was really quite easy. We, were, we just talked to each other and made sure that we felt comfortable. If you really want an expert opinion on how things operate around here. Two mil to you, 
Ten mil on the street. Easy. Ask your brother. Nick. What's up? Grump. Stuck me at the back like I'm a fucking chump. Watch yourself, babe. What's this shit? Put it down. I don't even know you. I'm Nikki's brother, you bastard. You got it wrong, kid. Let's put it down. Shoot him! Hang Shoot on. him! You got it wrong! Put it down! I can kill my brother, you fucker! Shoot him! Shoot him! Shoot him. Tanya character really interested me and um because there was a Tanya character in Once We Warriors in the book. She only featured in a couple of maybe one or two chapters. And there was one um description of her where she got put on the block and she looked at the character Nick and she looked at him like it was his fault. And I never forgot it. So when this character was put in front of me, I just thought, what the hell was going through that woman's mind? I didn't, that was my only reference to that character. So a lot of create, the, the creation of her was through um, me writing a diary. I kept a diary and just, um, as Tanya, the character, and every morning before work, I would leave my Parnell apartment. <laughs> go to a Parnell cafe and write this full-on diary of um, Tanya in the morning um, talking about what she's going to do for the rest of the day, you know, to try and get myself into it. But he was pretty hard on me. Um, what I realised was it was more about me learning how to stand up for myself in a male environment. And he was just being really, really... Um, staunched with me and like f for me during the auditions he would give me a, a, a direction and then I'd just sit there and mull it over and then he'd go look at me and I'd be thinking what the fuck um, but in the end um, and I never, I, know, I never take any of that stuff personally because it is about I reckon if you can figure out your relationship with your director and, and you nail it then good things can come out of it. And I kind of feel like that with me and him, we kind of worked out what it was that we needed to get from each other. And I needed to get, I needed to have the confidence to be able to stand up to him. And he needed to be able to feel confident that he could push me in places that he wanted me to go to. How long is he in town for? He can stay here. When you finish, you've got to wash your own cup. My mother's not a bloody maid. Joy wasn't a character that was, um, obvious on the page. She was a mother, and there's all kinds of mothers. Um, the, the dialogue itself didn't really tell you what she was like. Um, the way she dealt with her kids was the only thing, I guess, um, that gave me an idea about Joy. And one of the, but, but then of course we shot the film and then a lot of the kids' qualities got taken some of their characteristics got taken out of the film, so then I had, couldn't find her anymore. So I had to kind of rethink who the hell Joy was, and it wasn't until I got up to Pawaringa, and then I was, they put me in a um, house that one of the locals had very kindly um, vacated and, and given to us to stay in, um, and I was surrounded by hills, and I just went, 
oh my God, no wonder she wants her kids to be what they want to be because that's all you've got to look at. You've got this massive mound of hill and that's all there is. And then on the other side, you've got these layers of um, sea, uh, sand, sea, uh, bush, tree, hill, sky, uh, clouds, and then sky. So there's these kind of beautiful things to look at, but nowhere to go, if you know what I mean. So you have to get lost in it in some other way. Um, so it wasn't until I got there that I kind of went, okay, I get her. You know, I, I, she's a hard-working mum. She's just going to try and get food on the table. She hasn't got the opportunity to just, like, go off and have a latte. She's got to stay here, make sure everything gets done. It'll probably have to take, you know, she'll have to take a day trip into town to do a month's grocery shopping, so she'll have to be very careful about. So all of that sort of stuff I could think about once I got to the location. That funeral scene was... Um, Mm, yuck, it was yuck, I hated it, um, just because I've got my, my, my daughter was around about the same age and it, you know I just felt like oh my god I can't even think about her when we shoot the scene because I'll be tempting, I just felt like I would be tempting fate if you know if I kind of imagined her it being there, it was like no I'm not going to even think about that. So I, I, I kept doing a lot of stepping outside of the character and trying to find other ways to, to get go there emotionally and um, it was interesting watching the kids and how they coped and they had such a massive job um, to do those 20s um, but they did a good job and there was a bunch of good supportive people around um, but I suspect it was hard on them and I kept getting talking to their parents and just say oh you know prepare for for the crash at the end of the of the shoot because they'll probably get really hyped up and then it'll all be over and then it'll, they'll get really exhausted and probably have a collapse. Um, but yeah, it was great. It was the first time I'd actually been on a set where it was driven by child actors. Um, it was completely different energy. Um, but it taught me how to step back and, and let them take the reins. I had to do that a lot. You know, you kind of just, my maternal instincts would step in, but it was like, mm, no, just see what happens and see where they go with it. And don't, you know, don't try and hog the camera, Nancy. It's not about you. <laughs> uh, hey, has someone been messing with this? She was 14. Do you have children, Mr. Lewis? Two boys. Look, Mrs. Young, there was no proof that my client hurt your daughter. What would you do if it was your child? What would you want? I'd want justice. Yeah. You'd want justice. when we all started out here. It was hard. Hard making a living. <laughs> this country is great because of hard working men. Don't let us forget who our friends are, nor who are our enemies. Sniffing around that poor water girl. She's on the bus every morning. What am I supposed to do? Ignore her. We all know what those poor are like. Want to come to the movies? Sure. Simeon, you will no longer be attending the Patutahi cinema. Why? You remind me of him sometimes. Of grandfather? Men fight for what they want. That's a way of the world, Simeon. You're not a man yet. Only trying to toughen you up. He is toughest on the kids that he believes in. <laughs> the ones that might amount to something. You think you can hold this family together?
waits for his family, Simeon, who is nothing. Come on, Simeon. It is different from what we've seen before. Often we see Māori characters as downtrodden and can't dress properly or the, the houses are terrible and people's interpretation of what poverty looks like gets my goat sometimes. So I'm, I was really pleased. For me it is a true representation of a hard working Māori family of that time. Trying to stay ahead of the game, trying to stay out of poverty. Uh, what that meant was that, you know, clothes were well worn, hand-me-downs like any clothes would be of any kids of that age. One of the men to wear hats and look smart. If you look at a lot of photographs from that era, the men looked unbelievably handsome and smart. Just give up, Samin. You're never going to be handsome. Stay out of trouble. Look after your sisters. All right, come on. Off you go. And they dress incredibly well. They have a nice home. They drive good cars. And this is all about status. It's about making sure that everybody knows they're in control. They know business. They can make money and provide well for themselves. Most women in the 1950s and 1960s had a particular role to support their husbands. So they often were in these kinds of relationships where they were secondary and they were the helpmate. They were, by contract, the husband's property. I'm a great fan of Witties. He has this wonderful respect for women in all of his stories. Look, it's Nanny. Their strengths. What's she doing? Their dignity. She's saying goodbye to her bees. Gloria! And he doesn't just focus on one generation, it's like one, two, three generations of women. Yeah. I reckon that the, it's a, in the women in these families uh, where the heart of these stories lie. The quality of aroha which permeates through everything that she does. To me it's her story. You hungry? You